All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for showing up. We have, uh, what is it, like 35 degrees outside? Um, just back from California, and it's a whole lot different out there. <laughs> How's the air, though? Well, it, it recently cleared up. It started raining, yeah. so it washed a lot of that away. But uh, yeah, it's in the, in the 50s. Tornado went off. Oh, that, that didn't really hit California. That went the other direction. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah. It was bad. Yeah. So uh, we are uh, talking about Julius Caesar tonight. Uh, this was uh, a lecture I did over the summer, but uh, didn't record it. So Julius Caesar, one of my favorite characters, he had an incredible life. Um, these are just uh, a few of the books um, that I have here. Uh, the first one uh, is a real enjoyable read. It's, it's probably more for teenagers, uh, middle school kids. Uh, Manuel Komroff, uh, 190 pages, very easy read. Uh, this was back in the day, 1962, when they didn't have pictures on every other page for kids. Um, but it was an easy read. Uh, you want to get an overview of uh, Julius Caesar and his life and adventures. Uh, it's a good book. Um, it's, it's not, uh, it's one of those books that is written for kids to inspire them to be honest, just, and good. And so Julius Caesar is a wonderfully honest, just, <laughs> humane person in this book. And uh, I get from your reaction that uh, you know that's not true. Oh, not no, entirely no, true. Don't get in the way of his region, you're okay. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, so this next one, uh, Maria Weick, uh, Caesar Life in Western Culture. This one has a, a different approach. Um, this is not just his life, but how it has been portrayed throughout uh, the Middle Ages into the modern day. So she takes uh, particular episodes of his life and, and what happened, and then how that uh, has been portrayed uh, mostly in the Middle Ages and then down through our own day. So it's, it's kind of interesting how people have perceived Julius Caesar in various times. Um, the next one, uh, Christian Meyer. Uh, Meyer, sorry, I'm so bad at that. Um, <laughs> it probably is Meyer. Um, so this was a very scholarly work, um, 513 pages, uh, covers uh, in depth uh, a lot of areas of his life. Um, so probably the most scholarly of the books that I have. Uh, this next one, and I almost never uh, talk about or recommend uh, historical fiction for the same reason I don't like historical movies, because they often don't follow the truth, uh, reality. This was an, an incredibly amazing work. Colleen McCullough, uh, how many of you know what she's really famous for? Thank you, The Thorn Birds. She became very famous uh, for writing that, and that became a miniseries, I think, on TV. Um, she wrote this series over a period of 17 years, uh, The Masters of Rome. Uh, it's not just Julius Caesar, but it starts uh, in 110 BC with uh, Marius and then Sulla, and uh, each volume, each of the seven volumes, is intended to be uh, both a series and individually you could read uh, and take them individually as well. Um, so anyway, uh, if you probably have seen these in bookstores, if you ever go to used bookstores or uh, thrift stores or whatnot. Uh, they've been around, they've been very popular, very um, very well taken by uh, scholars. She's a very scholarly uh, sort of writer, and I, I do recommend these uh, with very little reservation. <clears throat> um, but uh, the, caution, the caution I would have is that the shortest of these seven volumes is 550 pages or so. Um, I think there's three of them that are close to 900 pages. Um, so it's not something that you take lightly. 
Uh, she's a very good writer. Uh, as I say, you learn an amazing amount of life in ancient Rome um, through these volumes. And um, it's okay. And, and the detail is amazing too. The, the trouble that I had, I, I, I read all seven volumes, one of the uh, great achievements of my literary <laughs> career. Um, I read all seven volumes. It was not easy uh, in parts because there are so many characters that she has in these books that sometimes it's hard to follow because of that. But uh, very well written. And anyway, so Julius Caesar, one of the most famous names in Western uh, culture, second only to Jesus Christ, I think, for familiarity. Uh, as you may know, Kaiser is a derivative of Caesar. Tsar, the Russian Tsars, that's a derivative also of Caesar. Um, after Caesar's death, uh, all emperors were named Caesar after him. Um, and we, I'm sure you know that one of the months of the year is named for him. Who is, what is it? July, July. July for Julius Caesar. As he was born in July. Um, the, the name used to be Quintilus, Quintilus, something like that. So I think July sounds better anyway. Um, so a little background. Uh, in the first century BC, uh, the Roman territory, uh, Romans controlled uh, all of the Italian boot, uh, the Italian peninsula, Spain, Greece, North Africa, and Illyricum, which is uh, you, the former Yugoslavia, now it's several countries. So that was the extent at the time. Um, they controlled the, the Alps, north of Italy, and just uh, on the other side of the Alps, uh, and as we know, uh, France was called what back in those days? Gaul. Gaul. So there was Transalpine Gaul, Gaul which was uh, just on the other side of the Alps, and, and then more northern, uh, which was not yet controlled by Rome. Uh, the, their republican form of government, which they were very proud of and guarded very jealously for hundreds of years, they had thrown out their kings uh, back in uh, 500 BC or so and decided that they hated kings. There was, they were not going to have a despot, a king in particular, ruling over them. They could elect and choose their own leaders. And, and uh, as I say, they were very uh, proud of that fact and guarded it quite jealously. Um, so their executive uh, was actually two consuls uh, they did not trust one person in power. So they felt that uh, having two people in power could check, uh, they could check each other and keep uh, from getting uh, a despotic ruler. Uh, the Senate uh, was usually 300, sometimes it was as much as 600. This was made up of the aristocracy, the patricians. Um, and then you have the assembly, which was composed of uh, wealthy commoners. Uh, who, were, who did not have a part of the aristocracy. And the magistrates, the judges, uh, would be chosen from among the Senate. They didn't have uh, a separation of powers back in those days. But at the time that we are going to be talking about, the Republic was in crisis. Um, there had always been tensions between the patricians and the plebeians and uh, often that led to uh, violence and civil war a number of times. And it, it led to a very shaky uh, government. The people were wondering if they could hold on to their, uh, their freedoms. Uh, but, yes? You know, uh, in a republic, what is an aristocracy? I mean, what, so, who, who are those people in the Senate? It, it's, it's much like uh, you know, if you get to more modern times where you have families that are considered, uh, you know, of better blood than ordinary people. So they would have the uh, patrician families 
that go back, you know, they, most of them would trace their ancestry way far back. Some of them would say that uh, my ancestor is a god. That's what Caesar did. Um, so yeah, it was, it was the family. You were born into a royal family or an aristocratic family. Sort of like the House of Lords? Yeah, yeah it would be like the House of Lords. Well, yeah. that's based, isn't that based on uh, land ownership? Uh, lords. Yes, somewhat, but you could still be a rich commoner and own land as well, but your family wouldn't go back uh, as far. Um, so uh, the issues as they, uh, that they fought over mostly, of course, would be taxes, uh, voting rights, land reform, and representative government. It was the commoners who uh, often were denied uh, certain rights that they expected, and it was not just the commoners, but the territories that were being controlled by Rome um, on the Italian boot. If they, if you were close to Rome, you were probably in a tribe that had voting rights. Uh, if you were a little bit further out, uh, you were probably in a tribe that did not have voting rights. And so, as uh, as time progressed, more and more people, as they were a part of the Roman Empire, uh, demanded uh, voting rights and uh, rep you know, representative government in the assembly. And this was some of the issues. Uh, another issue, of course, was uh, slavery. Slavery being very widespread throughout the world, really. Um, but as Rome conquered more and more territories, they could uh, capture more slaves. And as these wealthy families were getting more slaves, they would buy up more land to make farms for their slaves to work on, which put the ordinary farmer out of business. And so the or ordinary farmers would have to sell out, and they would often flock to Rome and be part of the rabble of Rome. And so they had to uh, mollify them with different things. We all have heard the term of bread and circuses that uh, the, the Roman government felt they had to dish out to, uh, to keep the rabble down. And that would, that's what was going on at the time. So Marius and Sulla. Uh, Marius um, was a, a, a general who won renown for his conquests and became consul uh, a record seven times, uh, which uh, a lot of people didn't like too much. Uh, but, uh, and then there was Sulla, who, uh, who also a military conqueror, who came and ransacked Rome in order to take over. Uh, these guys were kind of at the opposite ends as Marius was a man of, uh, was a commoner who became consul and wanted to promote the rights of the commoners, and he did. In order to achieve the, uh, uh, this power, though, he had to kill an awful lot of people. And that, that's kind of the story uh, that went back and forth. Um, and then once he died, Sulla became the uh, consul and then dictator, uh, and decided that he's going to go in the opposite direction, that the Senate needed the power back that they had lost, and killed an awful lot of people uh, in his reforms of the Senate. Uh, he had famously uh, set out a prescription of people and would put out lists of the <laughs> prescribed, and anybody who could turn these people in uh, would be rewarded with some of their property. And so it was a very uh, both popular and unpopular uh, decree. And uh, hundreds and hundreds of people were executed on uh, very little pretense because of that. What did they do for judicial decisions? So uh, as I said, the, it was the Senate would be chosen from the Senate, the magistrates, the judges, who would 
try people in courts. And um, that's pretty much how it worked. So like I said, there was no uh, separation of powers uh, back in those days. Oddly enough, Sulla, who uh, was dictator for about three years, stepped down at that point and retired and lived for a couple more years. Um, one of the few dictators in world history who would do such a thing, but uh, he did. Yeah, but he made sure that his, his finger was still in the, uh, uh, in the government, making sure that uh, nobody was going to overturn the uh, reforms that he had put in place. So now we come to Caesar. Uh, he was born in 100 BC, which makes it kind of easy. The math, when, when you try to figure out how old he was in any given year, uh, you start from 100 and uh, work your way back. So it makes it easier. He was born in a patrician family, but it was a, a patrician family that was on the decline. It was not a wealthy family, but it was patrician or, or aristocratic, you might say. Um, he became uh, a priest at the age of 16, um, which sounds kind of odd to us, but uh, the priesthood was a, a, an entirely different concept than what we think of it. I mean, you think of like a Catholic priest, someone who is supposed to uh, tend to his congregation and look out for them. Uh, a priest in Roman times is just someone who uh, fulfills particular uh, regulations and rituals uh, for their various gods. And so he became a priest. And this was a pre peculiar sort of priesthood uh, for the particular god he was priest to. Um, and he was not allowed to be a soldier. He was not even allowed to watch uh, soldiers march. He was not allowed to hold a weapon. Uh, there was a number of uh, particular regulations that he had to follow. And so, obviously, this was not something that was going to last with Julius Caesar. Um, but uh, there it was. So he married uh, Cornelia, who was the daughter of a consul um, at about the same time. And, um, and so he had Julia. His only daughter was born to Cornelia. So uh, the problem that uh, Julius Caesar had at this point was that uh, Cornelia, uh, it, her father, was on the opposite side of the uh, political spectrum as Sulla. And so Sulla, knowing Julius Caesar and um, knowing the family, ordered him to divorce Cornelia and marry somebody that he had chosen for him. And um, Caesar stood up for himself and said, no, I'm not going to, which is a very dangerous thing to say to someone who has killed hundreds and hundreds of people and thinks nothing of it. Um, but uh, he went into hiding because of that. Uh, eventually, uh, Caesar had uh, friends, powerful friends, who would plead for him to Sulla, and Sulla uh, let it go. He was not going to kill him after all. Um, and as I said, uh, he was a priest, but couldn't be a soldier if he was in that particular priesthood, so he gave up that priesthood uh, to become a soldier, and he was a very good one. Uh, he won the civic crown for bravery, saving the lives of other soldiers, um, he won in, in some minor engagements. And, and this is a time, by the way, uh, the Roman Empire, in all the years that it existed, was virtually always at war with someone. Uh, it may not have been a major war, but the size of the empire was such that uh, there were always tribes on the outside uh, that were having issues. And there were virtually always tribes on the inside of the empire that would rise up in revolt and needed suppressing. So there's always a war somewhere for a, uh, an ambitious soldier to fight in. And so he uh, distinguished himself early uh, as, a, uh, as a soldier. And now, um, I, I found this just for the fun of it. Um, 
he, he had his own special little adventure uh, at being captured by pirates. He was, uh, he was a very good orator, and he learned from the best. Um, some of you may know the name of the most famous orator in ancient Rome. Huh? Cicero. Cicero, very good. Cicero, and Cicero was a contemporary, a friend of his, and he wanted to be as great as Cicero, and so he went to uh, learn rhetoric at Rhodes uh, from Cicero's teacher, uh, a guy named Molon, but on his way there, he was captured by pirates, which was a very common thing too. Anytime you sail in the Mediterranean back in those days, um, there were usually pirates uh, roaming the seas, uh, ready to capture people or goods, and uh, you would be held for ransom. So, um, so he was captured, and they sent back, they could see that he was the important one of the bunch, so they took him and they sent his friends to, to demand the ransom. So they told Caesar that they were going to ransom him for 20 talents. Now a talent, I, I was gonna look this up and I, I totally forgot, but it's, uh, each talent is worth several thousand dollars. So this is a lot of money. And so Caesar looked at them and said, uh, that's a terrible insult for me. I'm worth far more than that. <laughs> you should demand 50 talents for me because I'm a very important person. And they said, okay, sure, we'll, we'll demand 50 talents then. Thank you for uh, letting us know. So uh, there was, it was about six weeks that he had to stay with the pirates uh, before the ransom was brought. And during that time, uh, Caesar uh, treated them like, he, uh, like they were his servants. Uh, he was a very proud guy, and, but a very charismatic, very likable sort of guy when he wanted to be. And so he would um, uh, put on a, an oratory for them, per perform for them, uh, and give some speech, and, uh, and they would you know, either say, yeah, we liked it or we not, and, and, uh, and he would call them a bunch of ignorant rubes uh, because they couldn't appreciate uh, his greatness as, as oratory. And he would tell them uh, from time to time that, uh, by the way, when I'm released, I'm going to come back, capture you all, and crucify you, just so you know. <laughs> and they thought he was joking. Uh, and so about six weeks later, his friends come, give him the 50 talents, and he's released. And he goes immediately and rounds up some ships and crews and comes back and captures the pirates, takes them to the nearest city, and demands of the magistrate there that uh, these pirates be crucified. And they were, just as he said. Uh, now, he was, since they were uh, relatively nice to him, uh, he had some mercy for them and strangled them first before they were <laughs> crucified. So that was Caesar being nice. <laughs> and, um, and by the way, uh, when he did capture them, he got the 50 talents and kept it for himself. I think I mentioned that before. Okay, so uh, as, as a person, Caesar was very intelligent. Uh, he had this restless sort of energy about him, always needed to be doing something, uh, but he was a very charismatic kind of guy, knew how to work the crowd, knew how to manipulate people. And, and he was a ladies' man, had several uh, very, uh, very, uh, now, I'm going blank here. Uh, very public affairs. And um, it, it, was, it was very common, not just with uh, ordinary people. We're talking high level uh, consuls or generals. Uh, if he found somebody that uh, he liked, he would uh, come on to her and, and have an affair. Even if it was a friend of his, the wife of a friend of his, he would, he would go and do that. Maybe some husband didn't kill him. Yeah, yeah, but the, the odd thing is, I mean, the morals of the day are so different yeah. from our day that um, it, it, 
for some of the guys, and, and this would be true in the aristocracy of uh, medieval Europe, yeah, yeah. that um, if you were a king, you would have affairs with various uh, women and the wives of friends of yours, and sometimes they're perfectly okay with that. Um, and they would get favors from the king because he, it, it was allowed. So, so yeah, um, he was uh, very high profile affairs, and, uh, and it was fairly accepted. Um, he was also very extravagant. He bought the finest of everything. Uh, he was into uh, very fine clothes, uh, horses, houses, uh, even though it, it cost him quite a bit, and he was very deep in debt for a lot of his life until later on when he started bringing in uh, the money. But uh, he could always get a loan from his friends, uh, very rich people. Um, and uh, it was said that sometimes his, uh, his affairs, the women that he would have affairs with, he would buy very extravagant uh, jewelry for them, uh, just for the fun of it, too. And his wife was still around? Yeah, and, and, and here's, you, you'll like this. Uh, so his, his first wife, and I, I may be jumping ahead, but his first wife died after 15 or 17 years or so. Uh, and he truly loved her, apparently. Um, his second wife he married um, was flirting with other men flirting with other men and he divorced her for that <laughs> because and he said that uh, the wife of a consul which he was planning on being had to be above reproach so she had to be above reproach he did not <laughs> so at the age of 30 uh, he was elected senator a very common thing, it was pretty much expected that at that age um, he, would, he would be a senator, and he would be a senator for life. It wasn't something that he had to uh, be elected to over and over again. Uh, and then, climbing up the political ladder, uh, he became a cura curator of the Appian Way, very uh, famous road in Rome, uh, basically to make sure that it was clear, that it was in good repair, and uh, get rid of the uh, robbers that uh, were along the way. And then he was an Adel, which is an urban magistrate, and he would put on, uh, in Rome, he would put on great uh, circuses and uh, improve and rebuild uh, the Circus Maximus uh, and put on great uh, performances for the people, which made him uh, even more popular because these were free performances mostly, and, um, and that's how you uh, climb the political ladder, making people like you. Um, and then he was elected the high priest, Pontificus, Pontifex Maximus. Um, it's like the Pope, uh, the high priest. And, um, and, and he was in charge of the, uh, the Vestal Virgins, making sure that they uh, lived up to their name. How about that, the guy like that? <laughs> but he did a good job, and he made sure, because this was a very serious thing. The Vestal Virgins were the, uh, the kind of the caretakers of people's wills, and that was taken very seriously. They had to be above reproach in every sense, and they were watched over that they remain Vestal Virgins. And, um, it, the penalty for losing your virginity was very severe. Um, tortures and, and uh, ultimately you'd be killed. But um, yeah, and that was taken very seriously. And so it was his job to watch over them to make sure that uh, they didn't start fooling around. Um, and he was finally elected uh, consul. Uh, the, the opposite, his opposite was Bibulus, who was opposed to him. Uh, Caesar, as, as in politics everywhere, if you are an ambitious uh, man or woman and climbing the ladder of success and, and uh, getting anywhere in politics, you will make friends and you will make enemies. 
Caesar, being a very prominent, charismatic sort of guy, made both uh, in spades. And when he finally got to the consulship, uh, unfortunately for him, the guy who was the other consul uh, opposed him uh, in everything and fought against everything that Caesar was promoting. Uh, Caesar uh, was, as a matter of fact, uh, promoting uh, voting rights for people. He was a, a senator, or a, a uh, aristocratic sort of guy who was fighting for the rights of the people. And so um, the opposite side, the uh, aristocracy was fighting against him. So it was a pretty uh, difficult time, but uh, he was a masterful politician and knew how to work people. So here's the Senate of Rome. And here's some of the main characters. Pompey was a general, he was called Pompey the Great. And I, I love this guy's face. I said this before, uh, he reminds me so much of a student I had years ago. Um, very dopey looking kind of guy, but um, it's rather unique in Roman, uh, as a Roman bust that you'd see a guy looking like this. Anyway, uh, he was a, an incredible uh, prodigy as a general in his early 20s uh, fighting with Sulla. He was uh, Sulla's uh, chief general that uh, did wonders fighting against the barbarians and conquering many people. He, um, he was uh, tasked to uh, take care of the piracy throughout the Mediterranean. And he was, they told him, we'll give you like three years to do this because there's pirates all over the place and it'll be a very difficult task to do because pirates um, almost by definition are really good at sea. Rome, the, the military of Rome has never been known for being great uh, seamen. And so it was, it was something that was seen to be uh, a very difficult task. And he was given three years to do it. He did it in three months and totally devastated the communities that harbored these pirates and rounded up the pirates and crucified them. And um, it, was, it was amazing. And so uh, Pompey the Great is what he was called uh, because of uh, his amazing uh, feats of military uh, achievements. The next guy, Cato, a very famous uh, guy, Stoic, who uh, uh, even today we have the Cato Institute, if you've ever heard that, um, revered by many today as, as someone who stood by his principles. Um, and I, I mentioned in uh, my Revolutionary Characters series, there was a play written by Joseph Addison in the early 1700s, uh, Cato, uh, about this character and what a uh, steadfast, hardworking, uh, incorruptible sort of guy he was. Uh, scrupulously honest, uh, wanted everything to be just uh, precise and, and perfect. And so he was, uh, he had dedicated himself uh, through self-discipline and hard work to, uh, to the achievements that he had. And he was known as being a real hard-nosed kind of guy the type of guy that you would want uh, in government, but not someone you'd want as a friend, because he'd be terribly annoying. Um, so anyway, Cato, as it happens, opposed Caesar in everything, and, and really feared that Caesar, this ambitious man, would be the next dictator. And so he opposed him, uh, whether he agreed with his, any given principle or not, he felt that Caesar needed to be stopped. And then there's Cicero, who at first was uh, in league or friendly with Caesar as he was growing up, um, but eventually sided with Cato uh, in the end. Oh, and by the way, one thing I didn't mention about Pompey, um, Caesar was, as, as he was uh, gaining popularity and uh, going from one office to the next, 
trying to make friends and allies. Uh, he knew that he needed Pompey, and so he married his daughter off to Pompey, who was much older than his daughter. But, um, and by the way, this was after Pompey divorced his wife because she had had an affair with Caesar. <laughs> so, um, so, so Caesar's daughter married Pompey, and they were in league with each other for uh, several years until Caesar's daughter died. Um, so, so Caesar tries to implement his uh, land reform. Land reform was a big deal, too, because so much land was taken up by uh, the aristocracy. Rich people had bought up so much land that there wasn't much left for anybody else, and it was all run by slaves. Uh, and so that was a big deal. Uh, Caesar tried to get land to be more evenly distributed. Um, so as I said, Biblis, the other consul, uh, was opposing everything and, and would veto uh, Cato when he could, filibustered everything. Um, but um, the people genuinely loved Caesar. As I said, very charismatic character, plus the reforms that he was <coughs> enacting were very popular too. So uh, the people in general were started to assault uh, when they saw Cato or Bibulus out on the streets. Uh, they could do some horrific things to them. Uh, one thing that they would sometimes do is gather up a bunch of uh, feces and throw it at them out on the streets. Uh, so eventually uh, they both had to just stay home and so Caesar uh, would enact his reforms illegally because uh, you had to have the other consul. You're supposed to have the other consul there. Um, but he enacted the reforms and nobody stopped him. So after his consulship, um, he had made some very powerful enemies. And um, it, was, uh, it was typical of an ex consul to be given a governorship in one of the provinces. Caesar knew that uh, if he got the right governorship, uh, he could uh, start his military career in conquering new lands. And so uh, he became the governor of Cisalpine Gaul, Illyricum, and Transalpine Gaul. And so once he got that, he traveled up north, crossed the Alps, and there is always, uh, and you know, I said before, there's always somebody to conquer. There's always somebody who's causing problems. And um, in Gaul, um, I'm sure you know, Gaul was not just one big group of people. It was many, many tribes. And I have a list here that I was going to read. And this is just some of the many tribes uh, that were in Gaul. There's the Sequani, the Averni the Suebi, Helveti, uh, Simbri, the Teutones, from which we get Teutonic, uh, the Ubi, the Alloborges, the Nervi, and I'm probably butchering a lot of these names, but uh, just to give you the idea of how many there are, uh, Eburones, uh, Treveri, the Carnutes, the Sinones, the Adui, Ad Adui and the Remy. And again, that's just a few. The tribes that were up in Gaul uh, were always fighting somebody too. Uh, their neighbors encroaching on their land, or maybe you have your tribe that wants to encroach on somebody else's land. There is always somebody fighting somebody else. And so Caesar went up there, and as, um, as the power of Rome was to control everything, um, the tribes that were within the boundaries of Rome would complain, uh, there's this other tribe that's bothering us, and so Caesar would come up and take care of the problem. Um, at, the, at the time, there were the Germans, I haven't even mentioned the Germans, uh, on the other side of the Rhine, uh, they would come in uh, every so often and take over territories, and, um, and so Caesar came up and he knew that this was going to be something that uh, was very easily justified. Uh, the Romans 
uh, had a sense of justice when they conquered territories. It was, you were not supposed to just go up and say, hey, there's some territory up there and we're going to conquer those people and take it just because we can. You go up there and you look around, hey, this, this tribe is causing problems. I'm going to settle this problem for them. And that's what he would do over and over again. There was always a tribe that was in trouble that would call for his help and he would come and pretty much wipe out the other tribe uh, if they fought back anyway. So he conquered and conquered and conquered his way up through Gaul, killing uh, multitudes. Uh, at the end of his 10 years of uh, conquest, he estimated himself that uh, he killed maybe about a million people. And maybe that almost as many uh, would be taken into slavery and sold on the markets uh, in, in Rome. And that's how he made his money, too. He would conquer a tribe, take their stuff, uh, kill a bunch of them, sell a bunch of them into slavery, and, and make uh, a fortune doing that. Did he have an independent army? Or what, what well, he was the governor of the territory, which means also that he was the military leader of that territory. And so, so he would be given. I'm sorry? They were conscripted from the territory? The military? Yeah. Uh, so there, there were conscripts, not necessarily from the territories, I mean from Rome. Mm -hmm. um, and back in those days, as, as I said, yeah. uh, so much territory was taken up by wealthy people that it was actually a, a, a good uh, option for many young men to join the military. They would always retire and be given <laughs> land. That was a big... That, that was something that Caesar yeah. was really pushing to yeah. in, his, in his later years, yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the promise of land, and, and even aside from that, um, you think of young men down through history, what is one of the favorite things for young men to do? Well, in our day and age, uh, we don't have nearly as much wars, but uh, uh, you, you go online and you fight battles all the time uh, in video games because it's fun to kill people. <laughs> and it is. I mean, uh, historically, uh, young men have loved battle because you get to kill people, you get to take their stuff, and you get to rape their women. And, and that's just the fact of life. That's what soldiers did, always. So, um, so he invaded Gaul and conquers all the way up to uh, the northern boundaries, and then he crosses into Great Britain. Okay, um, he, didn't, he didn't leave a presence in Great Britain. He crossed over the channel and uh, fought a few battles, subdued the, uh, the natives there, and, um, and then decided that uh, it was a bit much uh, to leave any uh, a garrison behind because they'd just be wiped out. So he conquered, says, I have achieved what I've achieved, and then came back into Gaul and promptly lost everything uh, to the uh, Britons. Um, but the last great battle that, uh, that Caesar fought in Gaul uh, was, was the most, uh, probably the most awesome of the battles uh, there was a, uh, a tribal leader, Vercingetorix, who uh, put together a coalition of tribes to uh, oppose Caesar and very nearly uh, achieved what he set out to do. Um, there were so many tribes that, that, that wanted to uh, conquer Caesar but felt that they couldn't. Uh, but they have this charismatic leader now, Vercingetorix, who's going to... Uh, gather up a number of tribes to uh, take on Caesar, and it took some time. Uh, the final battle was uh, here in Elysia, the top of the hill, this town. Um, Caesar saw that he was there, surrounded the town, and then uh, the other tribes who were also in league uh, surrounded Caesar. So Caesar was both 
uh, fighting towards the town and away also. He was surrounded on both sides. And if you notice in this picture, there are two walls, mm -hmm. one on the inside, one on the outside, and Caesar was in the middle with his legions. He was outnumbered four to one in this battle. And, um, and yet he still won. And the amazing, one of the most amazing battles that uh, was uh, fought at this time. We marched that leader all the way back to Rome and, and uh, came. You, you're getting ahead of me. <laughs> so anyway, uh, in France, by the way, Vercingetorix is still considered a hero for opposing, being the most uh, prominent uh, barbarian to oppose Caesar and almost take him. Is that where it is? In front of Notre Dame? I think so. Huh. So anyway, this, this painting was done, I believe, in the 1800s. And uh, it was done purposely to glorify Vercingetorix and not Caesar. You'll notice the most prominent character is Vercingetorix on this great white horse. And he is uh, above Caesar, who's sitting down here. So, yeah, national hero for France, but uh, defeated nonetheless. And um, as, as was mentioned, uh, he was taken to Rome and uh, kept there until Caesar could have his triumph. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, every time uh, a Roman general uh, conquers a significant territory, he's supposed to get a triumph back in Rome, which is like a big parade. So after this, uh, Caesar still has his enemies back in Rome. Um, as governor, Caesar could not be arrested for anything. Uh, that's how it works. If you are a magistrate, if you are uh, a governor of any province, um, you are uh, above the law in that sense. You cannot be arrested. But when you step down, you can. And so they were waiting for his term to be up. And this was 10 years. He got a five-year term and then another five-year term. And when that was up, um, Cato and his side was going to uh, arrest Caesar, bring him to Rome, and uh, probably execute him. Uh, if he got off easy, he would be exiled, but that was not likely. Um, so Caesar, of course, is not going to let that happen and decides that uh, he wants to negotiate uh, the situation. Pompey, uh, the other great general, uh, he's trying to uh, negotiate so that if, uh, if he gives up his legions, Pompey would give up his so as not to be able to attack him. Uh, and that sort of thing failed. Uh, nobody was going to give in to Caesar and Caesar knew at this point that he had two choices. He could either uh, step down and be arrested and executed, or he could march on Rome and become the dictator. Those were, uh, to him, the only choices that he had. So this is when he crosses the Rubicon and marches on Rome. Um, how many of you have ever seen the Rubicon in Italy? It's actually not much of a river. It's, it's, uh, it's on the, uh, the eastern side of the boot. And, um, but it was the dividing line between uh, the more central uh, Italy and the uh, province where you could not, if you were a Roman general, you could not bring your army past the Rubicon because that's seen as a threat. So he crossed the Rubicon, marched on Rome, and uh, Pompey, uh, for some reason felt that the, his best option in opposing Caesar was to leave Rome so that he wouldn't be uh, devastating the, the main city in, in a battle and crossed over to Illyricum. So they battled. Uh, there were a number of battles uh, uh, Caesar and Pompey fought. Uh, one battle in which uh, 
Pompey actually defeated uh, Caesar's army, but Caesar, of course, escaped with the bulk of his army. Um, and then finally, uh, he defeats Pompey in battle and pretty much devastates his army. And Pompey escapes to Egypt uh, and is killed there. <coughs> Caesar came to Egypt hoping to uh, capture Pompey alive. Uh, one of the things that Caesar was very good at is uh, winning his enemies back. When you defeat your enemy, it was typical to get them executed. Uh, Caesar would forgive his enemies over and over again. Not the same uh, enemy, you know, if you, uh, you can be forgiven once, but if you rebelled again, uh, you were not forgiven. But he forgave many of his enemies who had uh, violently opposed him, and uh, he knew that that made him look good. And so uh, he would do that over and over again, and uh, people loved him for it. Um, so anyway, Caesar uh, wanted to capture Pompey alive so that he could uh, forgive him. Uh, he uh, genuinely liked Pompey anyway, uh, but uh, when Pompey got to Egypt, they thought they would do Caesar a favor and kill him. So anyway, uh, Caesar comes to Egypt and he meets Cleopatra. Uh, and what a story that is. Um, and I mentioned this before, you know, I, I generally don't like uh, historical movies. How many of you have seen the movie Cleopatra with Elizabeth Taylor, uh, Rex Harrison, uh, uh, who's? Richard Burton. Thank you, Richard Burton. Yeah. One, one of my favorite movies of all time. It's not historically accurate in a lot of ways, but still, it's just a wonderful movie. I, I mean, you can't go wrong with a trio like that. Um, so Cleopatra was having uh, problems uh, of who's ruling in Egypt um, between she and her brother. Uh, they were supposed to rule uh, equally, but of course that never works out. And um, so he settles the, the dispute and, uh, and he had to fight the Egyptian army with their allies. And that was a pretty uh, difficult thing. So here's Elizabeth Taylor and Rex Harrison, Cleopatra and Caesar. Um, and if they didn't look like this, they should have. Because <laughs> this was just a great scene. So once again, uh, he is, he's conquered in Egypt and now in the east in Asia Minor, which we all know is what country today? Turkey. Turkey. Thank you. I'm surprised that you should all have known that. Asia Minor is Turkey, and uh, so there's a big revolt. There's usually a revolt somewhere around there. Uh, he had to um, uh, invade, conquer the, the local despot, and, uh, <coughs> um, and this is where he uh, gives his famous uh, Vini, Vidi, Vini Vidi Vici, although in Latin, it's, it's Winnie with the wiki, because the V has the W sound. And I knew that because I took the Latin class here. <laughs> uh, but this was his famous saying, I came, I saw, I conquered uh, in Asia Minor. And so even though he had defeated Pompey, there still were uh, Roman legions who were being led by the opposition. Uh, so he had to go back to North Africa and conquer what was left of uh, the Roman legions who were opposing him. And this is where um, uh, Scipio and Cato uh, had united with uh, King Juba of Numidia, which is North Africa, uh, uh, west of Egypt. And another campaign, uh, very uh, and I haven't mentioned this, um, but virtually all, or many of the campaigns that Caesar was in, uh, the battles that he fought, uh, he was more often than not outnumbered by his enemies and frequently uh, came close to disaster. Uh, and Caesar himself would run into the fray up to the lines and he would be wearing this bright red 
cloak so that everybody knew who he was. And he would inspire his soldiers to, uh, to redouble their efforts and, uh, and not to be defeated. And he did this time and time again. Um, and his, his luck was uh, phenomenal. And he was known as being just an amazingly uh, lucky person that he would risk his life so often and, and come out unscathed. Um, and this is where uh, Cato uh, commits suicide. By the way, um, I was going to mention too, in the, uh, in the play uh, by Joseph Addison about Cato, Cato makes the statement, and, and I'm, I'm not going to say it entirely correctly, but it's something that you will recognize. I regret only that I have one life to give for my country, which was taken up by Nathan Hale in the revolution. But that was from the play uh, about Cato, uh, who committed suicide rather than be forgiven by uh, Caesar. He knew that if he gave in, Caesar would forgive him and let him live his life. And that uh, was intolerable to Cato. So Caesar uh, comes back to Rome, having defeated his enemies, and um, he's now getting his triumphs. They were denying him uh, any kind of triumph, um, and he, he demanded that he get four of them. You do not get a triumph, by the way, for defeating uh, Roman legions. If this is a civil war and you win, you don't get a triumph. You only get a triumph by defeating foreigners uh, because it's, it's just not seen as being right to celebrate the defeat of your own people. So he gets his four triumphs. Uh, he instituted the Julian calendar, um, which gave us the, uh, a calendar almost like what we have today. Uh, there was one thing missing, though, because they had leap year. In order to institute this calendar, uh, the, the year everybody knew was way off. They didn't have a leap year. And so spring was now coming into summer, and, and all the seasons were just about uh, out of whack, so that winter was spring. And, and so uh, to institute this calendar, um, they created uh, a couple of false months and then started anew. And so they, they instituted the Julian calendar with the, uh, uh, the extra day in it to keep the, the months straight uh, throughout the year, or through the years. But there was one thing that they left off that I just kind of found out not too long ago, and that was in our calendar, we have every four years is leap year. But we also, every 100 years, don't have a leap year because that makes it a further adjustment. It's necessary to have a further adjustment, not just the leap year every four years. In the Julian calendar, it didn't have that. And that is why in, when the Western, when the United States, or the colonies, in the 1700s in England, they finally uh, accepted the Gregorian calendar. We're, I think, something like 20, uh, I forget how many days. 21 days. Was it 21 days? Yeah. We are 21 days off because every 100 years, uh, they didn't have the leap year. They had the leap year. So, so, year do? so it, it readjusts. So when is it? When is it? When oh. On the hundred year, two thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Four hundred years, isn't that right? Four hundred years. Well, we had to adjust something like twenty twenty one days, so I think oh, it was. That's true. But yeah, but now I think it's only every four hundred years you skip the leap. That that could be. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. 
But the, the point is that, that uh, everybody knew at the time that the calendar was out of whack and something needed to be done. And, uh, and Caesar, uh, as dictator now, uh, could do that without having to worry about people arguing about how to go about doing it. So um, there was a, a, another revolt in Spain that he had to go put down, and he did, and again risked his life, came close to uh, catastrophe, but pulled through again. Um, and came back, he's working hard for civil service reform, making sure that uh, bureaucrats are doing their job uh, honestly and efficiently, which has always been throughout uh, history a, a, a problem for every government, that bureaucrats be honest and efficient. And he worked very hard to have that. Didn't he also put down the slave revolt and crucified every one of them? No. He did not. That, that was that was not. Are you talking about Spartacus? Yeah. Yeah. That would that was not his doing. Oh no. That was that was before his time oh. as as a general. I think he was a lieutenant or something. Yeah. Something. Yeah. He wasn't. Don't nail him to the cross. Him. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. That was. Uh, uh, well Crass, be Crassus, done. I believe, yeah. was the guy who took care of that. Um, I leave them, left them out there for years just to rot. Yeah, yeah. Another great story in and of itself. Um, so, and of course, the other great reform that uh, he was fighting for was land reform because he had promised his soldiers, his boys, and he and the soldiers loved him for the most part uh, because, again, he had such a charismatic personality and he loved his men and wanted to take care of them. He did have a couple of times. Um, uprisings among the ranks because they were not always uh, well paid or treated well and you know in an army of many thousands of soldiers it's not always easy especially back in those days that uh, everybody get their due um, so he did have to put down a couple of uh, mutinies uh, in the ranks but generally speaking he was uh, well beloved of his soldiers because he he loved them and, and took care of them and, and endured all of the hardships that they endured. And here's Caesar in triumph. It's a great parade uh, that he would uh, have the, the, the emblems of those he has defeated in this triumph. Uh, and he would have many of them as slaves. And of course, Vercingetorix who had been uh, in prison for the last six years, six years since he was defeated, kept in prison, and now he's paraded in this triumph and then uh, strangled and killed at the end. Wasn't he offered, but, uh, did, did Caesar offer to forgive him? No, no. That See, that's, that's part of the deal when you are uh, when you conquer a territory and and you capture their king, uh, that's you you forgive your your uh, uh, in the civil war. Yeah, in the civil war, uh, he wanted to forgive all of his opponents, and and he forgave many people. Uh, but this was a different matter. This was uh, fighting foreigners. Um, so Caesar, uh, once he came to Rome. Uh, was uh, a voted dictator. Uh, first, it was going to be for one year, and then the Senate voted again for 10 years, and then he was dictator for life. And um, he, was, he was flattered, and he loved it. He, he was a power-hungry sort of guy. He did care about people in his own way, but yeah, he wanted power and he wanted to keep it. And so um, he had statues put up all over the place around Rome. Uh, some wanted him to be king. Uh, some called him a god, which was a fairly common thing again back in those days. Uh, you have your great hero uh, of the nation. Some people start to think, well, we should make him a god. Um, he, uh, he did not go for that. But he kind of liked it. I mean, who wouldn't, right? Um, and of course, because of that, 
there were others in the Senate who decided that uh, Caesar, uh, now that he's dictator for life, uh, we've lost our republic and we need to get it back. Um, this was, uh, the republic was near and dear, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, the Romans were very proud that they had had a republic for hundreds of years and they were going to defend it uh, with everything that they had. They rejected the very idea of a king, a king that would have their sons after them rule, and, and no one would have a choice in who's leading the country. Now that Caesar is dictator, and that uh, a lot of people are thinking maybe we should have him as our king, uh, the plot, oops, you haven't mentioned Brutus. There he is. Kind of out there. The plot to kill him, uh, Brutus being among them. By the way, um, Brutus was the son of uh, one of his affairs. Servilia, I think I got her name right, uh, was a woman that he had a long standing affair with, one of the most uh, prominent of his affairs, the longest lasting. Uh, the wife of a senator, and Brutus was her son. Some have speculated that it was actually could have been Caesar's son, but it wasn't because the affair uh, didn't start till after he was a young man. But anyway, so Brutus uh, and several other senators uh, got together and, and plotted uh, to kill Caesar, and um, so they did. And how many of you have seen uh, Shakespeare's uh, Julius Caesar? You all should have seen this, okay? You can't, can't consider yourself a well-educated person in America without uh, some familiarity with uh, Caesar, Julius Caesar as uh, Shakespeare's, even though it's not historically accurate as, you know, it's just not going to be. But it gets the point across, he was the plot uh, to kill Caesar because he has destroyed the Republic and we will bring back the Republic if we can kill Caesar. So went the idea. So uh, Caesar, oddly enough, uh, did not like having a bodyguard. It was his right and it was common for a consul to have lictors as bodyguards go wherever he went out in public. And Caesar said, no, I, I, I don't like that. I don't want this entourage of soldiers with me uh, to protect me as if I needed it. And by the way, uh, when I go, I want it to be sudden. I don't want to linger in old age. So however I go, I'm going to go as a soldier, or somebody's going to kill me outright, and it's going to be a sudden thing. I'm not going to see it coming. And, and that's exactly what happened. And the Ides of March, Caesar is stabbed to death in the Senate. It was said that uh, there were 23 stab wounds that, he, that was inflicted upon him, uh, but only one of them was the fatal one. The others were just kind of glancing blows that cut him uh, superficially, but one of them got him deep in the chest, and that was the fatal one. Do we know which one? <laughs> so we don't know which of the uh, the senators got that one in. Brutus didn't do that, right? Um, we don't know. We don't know. So, um, so uh, the uh, it would have been really nice if it it played out like it did in Shakespeare's play, because that's I mean great speeches in that play. I actually I love those speeches, uh, but uh, but it didn't work out like that. Um, but um, the, uh, the, the plotters who uh, put all this together thought that they were going to bring back the Republic and that people would hail them as heroes for getting rid of this awful dictator. And it didn't work out like that. Uh, they became very unpopular very quickly because people loved Caesar. And, um, it wasn't too much longer before they were all uh, defeated in the next civil war, and the uh, 
Of course, the next dictator, the emperor, uh, was Octavius uh, Augustus became, and he's the one who instituted the idea of um, be calling everybody Caesar from now on. The emperors, now the, uh, the first among equals, uh, would be called Caesar from that time on. And um, Augustus, who uh, was never much of a military leader, uh, was a great administrator. And he's the one who put, uh, he advanced the, uh, the reforms that Caesar had initiated. And bureaucracy turns out to be one of the things that Rome was good at. And the reason that Rome, uh, the empire kept together, uh, despite all these awful emperors down through the ages, uh, was because of the bureaucracy. It was a solid foundation, comparatively speaking, uh, of collecting taxes and administering justice throughout the empire. And that is really what held uh, Rome together for as, as long as it was. Um, any questions? Yes? How long was he actually a ruler, dictator, before they killed him? Just a couple of years. It wasn't, wasn't long at all. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much for coming. Next. So next week is Genghis Khan. So don't miss that one. That's a good one. Thank you. Thank you.